First of all, welcome everybody. Bienvenido. I see we have several um, uh, participants from Latin America, so that's great. So good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Um, my name is Kathleen Shearer and I'm the Executive Director of CORE, the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, and I'd like to welcome, welcome you to this session about user engagement and, and populating repositories. Um, this is one of, uh, as many of you know who are involved in repositories, this is such a, a challenging issue and one of the major challenges for repositories is really um, engaging with researchers on campus and um, uh, raising the visibility of the repository and um, providing rationale and encouraging researchers to deposit their content. So I'm really grateful and I would like to thank our three panelists for agreeing to share their experiences in their own organizational contexts. Um, uh, today, so we are going to have three short, fairly short presentations followed by kind of a question and answer or discussion period. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce e each of the panelists as they do their presentations, and then um, we'll kind of moderate the discussion. So either um, you can put your hand up at the end of the presentations um, if you wanna ask a question or share your experience, or um, you can use the Q&A uh, functionality which you can see at the bottom of the taskbar below the below the video okay so on that note I'd like to introduce our first presenter her name is Isabel Barnal from the Spanish National Research Council and I won't read the whole bio but she's um, uh, with digital CSIC services to engage institutional users so thanks again Isabel and um, and welcome You need to unmute. You're still muted. No. Perfect. You see my screen? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, those that know me uh, normally maybe are wondering what happened to my voice. And it's because of the open access uh, week. I've been talking too much on workshops in my institution and, and I've lost my voice. I hope that um, you will be able to, to, to understand me. Um, I'm going to, to present very briefly three, four strategies, uh, initiatives that we implemented um, in, in order to secure uh, content growth in our repository and also to, to, to foster active participation by our researchers. I want to um, present you, I don't know if it's, okay. So I want to present you first uh, a very successful initiative that we've had in place for the last uh, almost 10 years. Uh, I work in the department that is coordinating uh, all the programs with the uh, libraries within the research console in the country. And uh, together with the repository, we are also managing the institutional funds uh, to support researchers to publish in open access journals. And since the beginning, we wanted to integrate uh, and make these two different open access initiatives, the repository and the publishing funds to talk to each other. So we came up with the idea of making us one eligibility criteria to apply for the funds to have uh, open access uh, research outputs on the repository uh, already at the time of applying for the funding. And this has proved to be really convincing uh, for researchers to, to upload uh, contents in the uh, repository uh, before they can apply and, and get uh, discounts on the APCs uh, to publish in open access and journals. Uh, on top of that, we also have a second requirement, which is um, to get the commitment 
uh, from funded researchers to upload their more recent uh, research uh, outputs in the last three years on the repository after the article is published. And this has been a very, very effective uh, channel to, to, to secure growth content, open access content uh, in the repository. And we are also using the repository as the tool to show how many articles uh, CSIC, the research council, is funding. Um, because we are including in one specific metadata um, the acknowledgements that uh, our unit is paying part of the APCs and because of this we can also do analysis. Uh, we are um, more or less uh, funding around 500 articles per year and this is also a way of um, making researchers prove their real commitment with open access, no? because they also have to contribute with the uh, repository. This has been really successful. We are very proud of this initiative. Then um, we also put in place uh, other, other strategies uh, around a research data management and publishing. Um, we started already uh, four years ago to give uh, hands-on training uh, to researchers uh, for them to learn how to clean, uh, refine, merge, uh, create uh, nice um, visualizations, um, uh, mix their data as you know a, pre a pre previous step before publishing. Uh, now on demand, we are giving um, training on several tools to, to clean or to publish data. I, I put there on the slide a few of the uh, tools that we are um, teaching. And this has really helped our researchers to, to, to make, um, to prepare nice data before and they upload them on the, on the repository. And also, to, to, to show them, and also we are supporting them to uh, create maps, to geolocate data, for instance, or to create um, online exhibits uh, out of the contents that they are um, uploading in open access in the repository. Uh, we also, um, in 2016, two years ago, we started to give DOIs to non-traditional outputs. And this has been also a successful strategy to, to, to foster more participation, more types of contents on the repository. Uh, now we are giving DOIs through data site membership uh, to data sets, to preprints, to software. And the last uh, to come, uh, it's been uh, open lab notebooks. So we've seen also uh, through these last two years more interest in the repository um, because researchers uh, uh, got more information about the opportunities of the repository to, uh, as the window and as the platform to publish this kind of contents that before were on their desktops. And uh, last but not, not the least, we have created um, <clears throat> platform which is um, publicly available where we are giving very short summaries of uh, self-archiving uh, policies and also on uh, data sharing policies by journals. And we started to do this to, to give more focused information because you, you all know that sometimes um, journals um, policies as regards um, self-archiving and also data sharing uh, may be uh, uh, too complex to understand and to, to get the part of information that is important for the institutional repository. So um, we are creating this platform. It's an interactive tool where um, researchers can go and, and check uh, what version of an article uh, may be uploaded in the institutional repository, precisely on the institutional repository, and also 
what are the um, basics of the data sharing policies of journals. So this has also been um, a facilitator for, for researchers to, to upload things in the institutional repository. And last but not the least, we are also um, working a lot with the IT uh, teams uh, that are responsible for um, research institutes and websites because uh, we also want to prove them that all the contents that are being uploaded in the repository are going to have a positive impact on the websites of the institutes. And uh, for instance, um, we are now promoting, I mean, we've been doing this for a number of years, uh, promoting the repository as the content provider for the institutes of the research console uh, to create their pages with list of publications out of the contents that are already in the repository and also uh, for them to reuse, to import uh, massively uh, profiles, uh, researcher profiles that are available in the, in the repository. There are different examples. These are all, um, you have the links for, for you to see uh, more clearly. Um, we are also engaging with open science projects. We are uh, proactively uh, looking and contacting um, teams that are um, experimenting with publishing non-traditional uh, research outputs, for instance, scientific blogs, uh, and we are offering them um, the repository as the platform to publish uh, the, the results of, of projects. For instance, we are doing that with one um, well-known uh, scientific blog in Spain, which is about aging and all the, and the, the impact on society. And they are using the repository as the platform through where they are um, disseminating all the studies they are doing on, on, this, on this topic. And uh, finally, um, we are also um, offering the service of uh, working as a publisher and uh, for some institutes that are um, publishing journals or magazines or um, uh, scientific um, <clears throat> other types of uh, more divulg divulgative uh, publications, we are giving them the opportunity to, to use the repository uh, to publish. Um, their, their journals and giving them the DOIs, uh, etc. So uh, these are some of the strategies that we are uh, using and are being successful thus far. Thank you. Thanks, Isabel. That's so interesting. Um, and it seems like you have a very multi-pronged strategy. So you're not just working in one area, no. but <laughs> several areas. Um, so I'm going to introduce Tuja now. And uh, again, we'll leave the question and answers for the, after the, all three panelists have spoken. Um, so our next presenter is Tuja Korhonen from Helsinki University Library. And she's going to talk about the data support services at the University of Helsinki. Okay, thank you, Kathleen. So, share. And then. Can you see the presentation now? Okay, yeah, that's good. So, so I'll be talking about the data services at the University of Helsinki and how we engage with researchers. So here is some information about the University of Helsinki. It's the oldest and biggest university in Finland. And uh, we, um, we have four campuses, 11 faculties, so it's a multidisciplinary university. 
and and I work here at the city center campus where there is some 21,000 students so this is the biggest campus is in the center and then the library where I work is organized this way that we are under the rector and our university library is Kimmo Tuominen and we are organized so that we have these three different units we have learning services which is customer services and uh, information literacy services also and learning services then we have access services which is about collections and metadata and then we have research services where i work and we deal with publishing and um, metrics and data management where i where i work now what kind of open science services we have at the present here at the library we support researchers, teachers and students in advancing open science in various ways. We have a digital archive held, which is actually it's a repository for publication. It's not, it's not meant for data. And we have a research output portal called Tuhat, uh, where researchers uh, can um, uh, can publish their publications and then they see these and we have support for that also here at the library and then we have support for open access publishing we have uh, negotiated uh, con contracts with publishers and then we support that we have some discounts on article processing charges APCs and then we are uh, developing this Helsinki University Press. It's a, a public publishing service. It's not really uh, working yet, but it will be here. Yeah. And then we have data support services where I work. We give researchers support in, in data management, writing the data management plans. And we have guides on them. I'll be talking about them in greater detail soon so and some words about the history of data support we have the library has actually quite a long history in networking with the researchers we have a 10-year anniversary coming up next year and then when we did up develop this dmp tool tool which is a tool for writing data management plans we collaborated nationally there were several research organizations in in developing this this tool and now that the academy of finland requires data management plans uh, as part of funding applications then it really has uh, given us a boost in in our in our services and and that has again given it means that we have to develop trainings for data management planning researchers need this and and also they need all kinds of services for data management so we have then developed those and what supports us in our work is Helsinki University data policy which was uh, published 2015 and this is how the data support is organized at the University of Helsinki. So the library co coordinates this, but also um, IT services are involved in this because obviously IT services are very important in, in data, data services. We also have lawyers with us and central archives, data protection, and, and the research affairs at Helsinki University. And you can reach us through this one email, data support at helsinki.fi. And one thing that we created last, uh, well, was published this year, was this kind of wizard where researchers can order data services that they need. You just click on one of these, if you, for instance, if you need to store data then you click on that store data 
and then you're directed to the correct services. You can also contact the services by the same address to data support with Helsinki.fi. And then the tool for writing DMPs, this DMP tool, tool. it was, a, as I said, a national project. And it's based on DMP online code that has been developed by UK's um, DCC. And all that we have guidance and uh, data management plan templates in the in the tool and those are updated every year and then we ask researchers feedback on those on those guides do they work what is missing was it useful and things like that actually we're sending a new survey for the researchers tomorrow Let's see how how this tool has worked this year and also the tool contains links to guidance and organizational guidelines. So everything is collected in, in one place for the researchers. And then we have all kinds of trainings and workshops for researchers. When um, the Academy of Finland's call is on, we have these uh, workshops on DMP writing, DMP tooli workshops we call those and then we have also lectures on research data management basics the kind of the basic issues about research data management and then we also promote our services at various events that the university has and and then we have guides on research data management here you can see the people who, are, who, are, who work at data support. These are not only people from the library, but all the people who, are, who work in data support. And we update this guide also, whenever it is needed. And quite, one quite important service that we have is this DMP review service. Uh, researchers can share, send their uh, data management plans to us and we review them and give feedback and comments. And this service was particularly popular when the Academy of Finland's call was on, which was on September. And we had this um, advertisement for our service. This, we had flyers and we also use this as our email signature, this Academy of Finland, the picture that you see here, it was our email signature. And what we are hoping, what, what we're doing at the moment and also developing in the future is, of course, all the guidance that we have, they need to be updated. Links need to be checked and things like that. And one thing that is very important is the, the, the service that the researchers really need is the services for handling sensitive data. We don't have, um, our, our services are not really good enough at the moment for handling sensitive data. We need to improve those. And then of course this uh, general data protection regulation that came into effect this spring that means that researchers need help with that. All the legal contracts and th things like that. And we hope to develop uh, some kind of um, services for, for e this kind of ERC funded research. They probably have bigger needs than other other funded research. And one thing that we're doing is we're trying to develop, that we're trying to think how to teach open science for undergraduate students so that the future researchers, they would know about open science practices from the beginning. They would know, know how to do it. And then 
again, we promote our services at different events here at the university and we try to adv advertise our services, and things like that. And, um, thank you. That was all from me. Thank you, Tuja. That was really interesting. I'm sure there will be questions at the end of the presentations. Um, so our third and final presenter is Edith. And Edith, I'm, I'm going to probably not pronounce your no, last fine. name properly. <laughs> Edith Goroff from the University of De Bresen and the University of Göttingen. And she's going to talk about researcher engagement at the University of De Bresen, University and National Library. Yes. Thanks, Thank Edith. you. Thank you, Kathleen. And I'm in the lucky position of working for a project in Göttingen and working for Debrecen. So that's why I'm in these <laughs> two locations at the same time. So I was asked to talk about research support services at, uh, uh, in Debrecen. And before I go, oh, oh, I have to share my screen. I'm sorry. Is it okay? Yep, we can see it. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. So before I go into the specifics of uh, research support services, I would like to give a little background. Um, uh, what actually was going on in the debates in the past couple of years, there was a new structure change in the library with uh, the introduction of a new strategy as well, which uh, had to respond to several demands on expanding collections, reorganizing and improving access to our collections, and uh, also introducing new innovative ways to use our collections. So um, we in, with all these goals in mind, uh, uh, new tools of corporate governance was also introduced uh, to the day-to-day -day life of the library with the PDCA cycle to ensure the, the constant check and feedback uh, on the developments, um, either covering on small workflows uh, or comprehensive strategic um, changes as well. So this ensures a steady uh, way of um, uh, developing the new uh, services. Uh, one of the priorities of this new structural and the new strategy was the research development uh, uh, services and how to improve uh, researchers' engagement with the uh, library. And um, I will uh, talk about these uh, issues in, in a moment um, in more detail. But you can see that overall, in all these services, uh, uh, priority, uh, was a special emphasis was put on the open access and open science practices uh, within the, uh, the services. So the first is, uh, um, was really an, a major issue to improve the access to our resources uh, and uh, um, provide a user-friendly uh, gateway to, for our researchers uh, to all our databases. So a new discovery tool, a new service was uh, introduced and developed, uh, which actually uh, um, one way into all of search engine in all of our databases um, at the same time so and in our catalogs as well uh, the other major uh, emphasis was on the, our institutional repository we already had a repository for more than 10 years but uh, in light of the uh, open science uh, advancement and the open access publishing uh, um, requirements uh, we really had to reorganize and reinvent a little bit our uh, uh, repository, repository and a new interface was uh, launched uh, um, and the collections were reorganized for easy and user, more user-friendly access. And um, the repository is really important uh, um, infrastructure point in, in our uh, support services because um, there are institutional mandates uh, in Debrecen uh, for all 
PhD dissertations to be uploaded. And also uh, in the medical department, uh, all the promotional processes are based on the content in uh, uh, the repository. So all medical faculties have to uh, upload their um, uh, publications to the repository in order to, to be um, um, included in the promotional uh, processes. So this is a really good, uh, like a best example for other faculties um, and they are actually following uh, as, as well. Um, our, the, the content of our repositories are channeled through uh, to, imp to improve more visibility of uh, the institutional results uh, through uh, channeled through uh, a, a research um, profile database, uh, which actually um, gives information about our uh, about our researchers and. Uh, um, you can see the publication lists uh, of their uh, of the researcher who are they co-authoring uh, with um, whether you can access or you can see it on, on the screen you can whether you can access uh, that particular um, publication or not um, or through the database or th is it open or not so there are a lot of information on these uh, research profiles which is uh, actually uh, coming through the repository content so our researchers uh, in all faculties are encouraged to uh, to upload their uh, publications and we are really uh, collecting postprints, preprints, uh, urging them to save these uh, versions and, and upload them uh, in order for us to be open there uh, on these uh, uh, lists. Uh, another um, service that we introduced uh, recently is the um, um, OJS pl platform and search uh, engine, uh, which uh, uh, allows all OJS uh, uh, compliant um, um, journals to be searched within Hungary. So this is like a, a national um, search engine um, for all open access journals, Hungarian open access journals to be uh, searched at the same time. And uh, the new platform was just recently launched and uh, um, populated with the uh, appropriate content. Um, another uh, development was in a couple of years ago, an OA mandate was uh, included in our um, publication, um, copyright, publication um, rules uh, at the university. And, um, we require uh, our researchers uh, to archive uh, their um, publications and make open access within 12 months or as the uh, publisher uh, requirements allow it. And um, uh, this is uh, all to, to populate our repository with uh, open access content um, as much as possible. And we also, an institutional fund was set up uh, for APN to help uh, to pay for APC charges and uh, the library is coordinating this process. And while we are checking whether it, uh, the APC support can be uh, issued or not to the researcher, we are also consulting the researchers where to publish and uh, how, um, what are the copyright requirements and and how to actually comply with these uh, rules and we are also giving statistics uh, open access monitoring uh, tools uh, through our uh, research profile database and uh, the repository as well um, we also organize uh, trainings um, we are actually included in the, some of the PhD courses already. We, um, recent, we have like one or two uh, classes um, per semester um, in uh, several different PhD courses, uh, talking about uh, open science practices, open access publishing and licensing issues. And uh, also we are um, organizing workshops and, and seminars for uh, our elder <laughs> researchers uh, to get acquainted with this new paradigm of, of open science. And um, um, we just started uh, consulting, consultation uh, about research data management. Uh, there are several journals require um, the, the publication of 
research data, underlying research data. So uh, we had several requests from researchers to, to uh, give information about where to um, archive and how to make it um, public. And we are in the beginning of starting to, to develop a research data um, archive because our repository is not suitable to, to house um, bigger sets of data. So it's in the development, but um, in the, during uh, this uh, development period, we are giving a consultation to the researchers about our DMPs and uh, policies. Um, yeah, it's probably the, I've already talked about it. And overall, uh, knowledge management in the library is a, a, a major uh, issue that we are always, we were always uh, uh, adamant about. Uh, um, uh, not just developing through our services, but also educating our our uh, researchers and PhD students and uh, all the students uh, in general how to actually. Uh, be um, um, in line of the, in these new mandates and, and uh, requirements, not just uh, the national ones, but the international um, EU-related uh, uh, funding uh, policies as well. So it's really important uh, in our services. And that's it, basically. Awesome, thank you so much, Edith, and thank, thank all, um, all of you for your excellent presentations. Um, so what I think we could do now is start with the question and answers, or so you can either put them in the, the question and answer box at the bottom, if you click on it, there's a place to do that, or you can put your hand up um, and we can, and is, um, Ilkai will turn on your microphone if you want to just ask your question directly. Um, and if possible, if you have somebody specific who you want to answer your question, please put their name in, in the box. Um, so I think we have already one, one question from Christy. Um, and Isabel is going to answer it. Can you read it out too, Isabel? And you're st you're on mute also because the 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 question has disappeared for me. Oh. <clears throat> okay, so the question is one second. Hi, Sarah. Can you speak a little bit more about how you are pulling repository content, profiles, outputs into the various institutes? Is it automated in any way? Okay, yeah, so um, we've been working on this um, strategy for a number of years because what we didn't want to see was the um, creation of little repositories like within the Institute's uh, websites. So um, what we have been doing is to um, offer the IT teams, the people responsible for the websites of the institutes, um, the in import, massive import of metadata of the publications of that specific institute for them to reuse, to, to populate automatically their uh, web pages on their uh, websites. So um, a number of institutes, like um, periodically, uh, get all these um, uh, files with the metadata of their publications in the repository, and they embed it uh, into their uh, website. Um, there are different uh, ways um, institutes, uh, IT teams are doing this. Some of them are really um, reusing, so they uh, pull all the, the metadata and they create a page that is being updated periodically. Um, other websites um, are doing something more, uh, more easily, which is just to link, uh, you know, their web page with a list of publications per year is simply a link to their publications on the repository. And now what we are um, 
working on is to offer the same service for the researcher profiles. Uh, we've been having, um, first of all, I didn't say, um, our repository is on this space Chris uh, version, and uh, for the last two years, we've, we've been creating uh, researcher profiles. Um, so it's the same thing. We, don't, we, we are trying to discourage uh, institutes websites to create a you know, section with new profiles because this is a real risk in the institutions, in the duplication of efforts, uh, many different teams doing the same. So right now we are um, offering, uh, we are developing uh, a tool to offer uh, all the profiles in XML for the IT teams to, to embed into their websites. And we also are, um, we, we prepared a policy before the summer, uh, an official communication uh, for all the institutes. So I'm not talking about the main official website of the research console, I'm talking about the websites of every single research institute that belong to the council. Um, explaining that um, the repository is, is offering this service and that the researcher profiles um, uh, should be updated on the repository and use it as the main source to, to, to feed all these other uh, websites. And I, I really have to say that this, this is also working and it's also um, in, showing in, in a very practical way, for instance, to institutes directors, and why it's also useful to have all the contents of the institute available on the repository. Because um, I remember that when we started the repository, uh, the institute um, websites uh, were used to keep, you know, the typical uh, flat list of publications and nothing else. And now with uh, this integration with the website, with, with our repository, they are really giving um, more updated bibliographical information about their own publications and they're also giving open access because from their institute website, they are connecting to the repository. Um, so uh, this is also helping us, uh, the repository, to, to to be better known um, amongst the institute's communities because sometimes it's the repository uh, may be too far away from uh, the institute's website. So I think in general, we, we can do many things in this respect, work with the IT people in the, in the institutes. Also, uh, for instance, we, we threw a campaign for all these uh, websites to, to put um, a link uh, to the repository on the homepage. Uh, so, uh, so that it would be very, very easy to, for people that are going to these websites to, to get to know the repository and also to access all these uh, research outputs. Um, Thanks, Isabel. Um, I wonder if we could just, um, we'll, we'll give your voice a break for a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a, um, so there's a question from Paloma and then a question from Gail in the chat. So let's go to Paloma, who has a question for Tuja. Uh, could you please tell us a bit more about how DMP Tooly works? Does it generate the DMP automatically? It is open or just the University of Helsinki? Thank you. Uh, well, it's a, it's a national tool, so it's not only in University of Helsinki. Other organizations in Finland can have, have created guidance in, in the IP tool as well. And actually, well, anybody, anybody can use it. They just have to sign up for it. Well, I don't know what you mean by this generate the DMP automatically. There are boxes that you have to write. You write in those boxes, there are questions that you answer in those you answer write your answer in, in the box and then there's 
also guidance that maybe it's better if I show you. Can I, if I share my screen? Is it? Sure, go ahead. It doesn't <laughs> take too long. Yeah. So I think it makes more sense if I saw that. So this is what 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 it looks like. Oh, I chose um Finnish template now. So <laughs> this is also in English. It's mainly in English actually. So here you this is the general description of the data. Here you here you write something and here you then open guidance and then you have to save. And then when you have saved everything, you go here, download. And you can download your plan. And you can also share this plan if you have collaborators. And it's like, so yeah, you, you write here and then you can download. You can, okay, I can show you that too. It's, And then it creates this, and then you can send it to the to the funder, and it's done. Okay, th thank you, Virgil. Um, we have also in Canada have a similar national. Mm. DMP yeah, it's based on DMP online code, so. Um, so, uh, Gail also has another question for Isabel. Um, she says, we wonder how the requirements to have five items in the IR before eligibility for OA fund works with junior faculty. They may not have so many things to deposit at the time they apply. Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, this uh, eligibility requirement is for the corresponding author. Um, because you you know that sometimes within the same article there may be other uh, researchers from the institution also uh, as authors. Uh, so at the beginning, um, the eligibility criteria was uh, focusing uh, on articles. You know the requirement was to have at least five articles, five publications, open access in the repository. And then we actually um, realized that this was really a challenge for people that were doing, for instance, their PhD. Uh, and that's why um, four, four years ago, we changed, we revised the policy, and we opened that to any research outputs. So comprising uh, posters or, you know, a short article in one, um, uh, divulgative no? publication uh, or representation, these kind of things. So <clears throat> I have to say that normally we, we don't encounter any problem also because um, uh, even if there are researchers that are doing their PhD, um, normally they, they, they get to have five things in more like posters, presentations, uh, reviews, these sort of things. And if, um, if this junior researcher does, doesn't have five um, outputs, not on the repository, but they don't have five things published, then we never uh, use this as an excuse um, to hamper and then access the funds. So in this case, we would apply an exception, but we don't apply this exception for a senior researcher. So it's like um, zero tolerance, let's say. Uh, a, a senior researcher cannot come saying, you know, I don't have five things in open access because it's impossible. Um, because since we opened the range of research outputs, um, uh, and then in these institutions that are research intensive, they always have uh, conference posters and presentations and uh, training workshops, uh, material. So I have to say that uh, people comply with this. Also, um, 
is very convincing, you know, because uh, I don't know how it's in your institutions, but normally when our researchers come to us um, asking for funding, it's really at the very last minutes, you know, before publishing the article. Uh, so it's at the very uh, last phase of the process. So, you know, it's like um, they cooperate a lot. They don't put any problems to upload things. Of course, we also provide with the uh, mediated archiving service. So it's also a librarian can, can help the researcher to upload uh, the works and um, it, it always works fine. And uh, probably it's, it's the more tricky part is, is the second requirement, which is that they commit to, to uploading their more recent uh, outputs once the article is published. So there we really have to, to, to chase them sometimes because, you know, some of them think, okay, my article is already, already published, so I forget about this, but we are really taking these things seriously um, because the fund is very limited. We don't have so much money. We have a lot of requests. So we think that those researchers that get the money uh, also, you know, have to be uh, loyal and serious about this um, open access commitment. But it's, it's working quite well and it's also, um, a very useful, effective way for researchers to get to know better this open access channel. Because before that, a lot of researchers think that um, the main open access avenue is publishing. So. Thanks, Isabel. Um, so we have uh, three more questions, which I hope we can get through before the end of the hour. Um, the first, the next one is uh, Jose, and he says, uh, this is for Tugia. To whom are the DMP reviews available? Well, uh, it's for University of Helsinki researchers because we, are the, we work for Helsinki University. And then other organizations have services for, for their researchers. So this is only for Helsinki University researchers. And do they, are they submitted to the university or are they submitted to the funding agency, the final reviews, Tuja? Uh, well, we, we send the feedback to the researchers themselves and then they improve their DMPs and then they send the DMPs to the funders. We don't give the reviews to the, to the funders, no. Okay. Um, and so then we have another uh, question for Isabel from Jose. Do you apply or request protocols and or metadata standards to pull content from the institutions? Okay, so um, maybe I have to say a couple of words about the Research Council. Um, so this is not a national repository, this is an institutional repository. Uh, that is giving service to, to all the institutes that are part of the same institution. So we are always uh, talking about um, putting contents from the same institution, which is the council. Uh, of course, I mean, um, we have been also uh, promoting for really many years the mediated archiving service, which means that um, all institutional researchers may upload their own outputs, but we are really promoting the mediated archiving service because in our experience, the metadata quality and also the degree of completeness uh, um, are much higher if this mediated service is, is in place. Uh, so we have a lot of guides um, for for researchers and for all the institutes to describe things um, accordingly. Um, I don't know if this is what you are asking, but yeah. Most, most of the contents that are being uh, uploaded in the repository 
are, are made through this mediated service. So the institutes that are pulling all the content in the repository uh, make use of their, of their research library to do this. Thank you, Isabel. And uh, I have one last question from Sylvia um, in Argentina. She says, hi, Tuja. I've, I counted 18 people in the picture of the data support team. Bravo, congratulations. We would like to know how does this important support you give to researchers impact on the number and quality of data sets uploaded in the repository over the years? Uh, well, we really have no data about that. Has it improved? And as I said, we don't really have a data repository at University of Helsinki, so we don't know. But, but we think that this improves the research, the management of research data that we give this support. We, hmm. Yeah, I, I know in the Canadian context, just asking researchers to complete a data management plan has resulted in anecdotally in much better data management practices because yeah. researchers have to think about managing the data before they exactly. collect the data. Yeah. 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 Well, it's it's 12 o'clock. It's on the hour. Um, so I want to thank you again, all three panelists. That was really interesting. Um, I've taken down quite a few notes and I think um, this webcast will be kind of the launch of some more activities at core around supporting the repository community um, to share ideas for um, engaging with uh, researchers and providing extra value to the repository. So um, uh, uh, I'll probably send a message out to the core uh, members soon about this webinar and some of the notes I've taken and then some ideas about how we can follow up on all of this. So thanks again to all of the panelists and to all the people who participated. And have a good day. Bye, everybody.